Well, we continue with our discussion of fistiforms. Uh, we, uh, we mentioned at the end of last lecture that uh, Fister's theorem characterizes all quadratic forms which are hereditarily multiplicative. So, for instance, um, let's begin with uh, maybe a one Fister or two Fister form to start with. So, if you just take one A. <laughs> What's too bad? Ah. Ah, that's fine now. So, you, this is a one fist of form. So, the quadratic form is simply x squared plus a y squared. And we want to say that uh, the values of this form, non-zero values forms a group. But uh, the values of this quadratic form, we all know, these are simply norms from the quadratic, quadratic extension k square root minus a right assume a minus a is not a square then the values of this quadratic form are precisely the norms from this quadratic extension and we know the norms are multiplicative so the for the one fold fister we already know that the values non-zero values form a group a similar argument also holds for a two fold fister form this is simply x square plus a y square plus b z square plus a b t square. This is a four dimensional form. Once again we see I mean that this form is precisely the norm form from the quaternion algebra h what we described as h minus a minus b that is elements here look like uh, alpha plus i beta plus j gamma plus um, i times j delta where i and j are the quaternion generators for this quaternion algebra i squared is minus a uh, uh, j squared is minus b i and j anti-commute and then the norm from the quaternion algebra for this element is simply alpha squared plus a beta squared plus b gamma squared plus a b delta squared this is the norm uh, the values are precisely the norms from the corresponding quaternion algebra h minus a minus b and we also know that the norm from quaternions is multiplicative so this again is a multiplicative form. One can also go one step further and when you take a threefold fister, I will not uh, explain uh, explicitly what is the, there is a certain octonian algebra associated to this um, threefold fister form which also has an involution which also has a norm and uh, this precisely is the norm form on the corresponding octonian algebra and the norms from octonians are multiplicative. So here again the multiplicativity <coughs> follows because of properties of norm. But basically the phenomenon stops here and you just um, have to think of something more in order to see that for any arbitrary n fold fister form it is multiplicative. Okay, even to see it's multiplicative. Okay, so so let me begin with uh, two criteria uh, for uh, multiplicativity I am just trying to outline a proof of Fister's theorem. Criterion 1 for multiplicativity. Okay, remember you say that an anisotropic form is multiplicative if the non zero values form a group hereditarily for all extensions of the base field. That is the definition of multiplicativity. So, Q is multiplicative, Q in n variables. Is multiplicative if and only if uh, for variables you take two sets of variables x1 x2 xn and y1 y2 yn you take two sets of n variables you just take uh, the value of q on x and the value of q on y is a value of of q over the field where all these indeterminates make sense kx1 x2 xn y1 up to yn so you adjoin to n indeterminates and generically if the product qx times qy is represented by q over this function field in 2n variables then in fact q is multiplicative and vice versa so this is the first criterion for multiplicity but um, it's after we have seen specialization theorems and so on we did last time it's not uh, too strange 
because of course if q is multiplicative then this is a value of q over this function field qx and qy is also a value of q over this function field so the product is a value of q over this function field so the only non-trivial part is the other way is the non-trivial part to check so that means that we are given that qx stands qy is a value of q over this function field you want to conclude that q is multiplicative this again is a consequence i guess of um, specialization suppose v w two vectors in kn such that qv is not zero and qw is not zero and you want to show that qv times qw is a value of q but then you can do successive specialization y to the vector w and x to the vector v and we have seen we can specialize values so specialization implies So qv times qw is the value of q over k. So this is an immediate consequence of the so-called specialization theorem which says that if you take a value, uh, you take a polynomial value of a quadratic form, you specialize wherever it specializes, it is a value of the form q below. Okay. So this, but it's a useful criterion we will see. And the second criterion I want to uh, mention. <coughs> criterion 2 for multiplicativity so this is the following suppose uh, q as before in n variables q is multiplicative if and only if for indeterminates x1 x2 xn a set of variables x1 x2 xn qx times q you take q times the scalar qx the value of q on the on the indeterminates over the function field this is isomorphic to q over the function field kx1 x2 xn so this is again another criterion for multiple uh, for multiplicativity so so proof so of course um, once again um, if uh, Suppose qx times q is isomorphic to q, then you want to show that the product of two values, two non-zero values is again a value. Then because of this isomorphism, you have that qx times qw is a value of q over kx1 x2 xn. So where w is any vector in kn and qw a non-zero value of q, then this product, because this product is a Rep is represented by the left hand side so it is represented by the right hand side so this is the value of q over this just use specialization again so this implies that qv times a specialized x size to any vector v where qv is not zero is the value of q over k so specialization gives this the other way around okay suppose q is uh, multiplicative So if the form is multiplicative, I want to show that this identity holds that qx times q is isomorphic to q. Okay, so let us use the previous criterion. So we know that for two sets of variables, qx times qy is a value of q, q over this function field kx1, x2, xn, y1, y2, yn. So this product is a value of q over this. Now look at this as a scalar and this as, let me just write it as sigma ai yi squared, where q is uh, a1, a2, an, the diagonal form. You see that this is a value of q over this function field. So once you have such an expression which is a value, we know by what is subform, what does subform theorem say? So I'll just write it again. So subform theorem. So qx times summation ai yi squared is a value of q over k x y. So subform theorem says. So this is a scalar multiplied by this homogeneous form is a value of q. 
subform theorem says that q x times q is a subform of q over the Rashi function field k s, right? Because if if the homogeneous polynomial treating q x as a scalar is represented by q, then the corresponding uh, form q x times q is a subform of the given form q over k x. But when you compare dimensions, both have the same dimension, and so this implies that q x times q is isomorphic to q over the Rashi fun function field in n variables. Okay, so these are the two criteria for multiplicativity of quadratic forms. Then maybe I'll just give at least some sketch of proof of Pfister's theorem. So proof of Pfister's theorem. theorem. So what are we given? We are given a form like 1a1 tensor 1a2 dot 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 tensor 1an for so some n and you want to show and let's assume that q is anisotropic. Then I want to show that q is to show q is multiplicative. So let us uh, use an inductive argument. Suppose n is 1, we know that 1a is known from a quadratic extension, so it's multiplicative. So assume that that q1, which is just given by 1a1 tensor with up to 1a n minus 1, just truncate it at n minus 1. Assume that this is multiplicative. Okay. And then you want to show from this that q is multiplicative. So let us take two sets of variables x1, x2, x2 power n minus 1 and y1, i2, y power 2, n minus 1. Let us take two sets of variables. So q, if you see q is the tensor product which can be written as up to n minus 1 which is q1 times 1 orthogonal a n times q1. So when you just expand it out, bunching all the this part together, you get q is isomorphic to q1 orthogonal a n times q1 and q1 is multiplicative. So this is q1 of x times q1 orthogonal a n times q1 of y times q1. Okay, Because q1 is multiplicative by the criterion which we just showed, q1 is isomorphic to this and it's also isomorphic to this. So we have this. Now, if this is let us write this as q1 x comma a n q1 y times q1. Okay, this binary form times q1. Now, if you look at this binary form, it certainly represents q1 x plus a n q1 y, right? So this binary form represents this value. So, so you can write this as this is exactly the comment in uh, Connie's lecture also. This is q1x plus an times q1y which is represented and it is uh, just a binary form. Once you know a value, what is the other slot? It is just determined by the determinant of this quadratic form, right? So the other value is simply q1x plus an q1y times this q1x a bracket here times q1 x times a n times q1 y okay i just have to put whatever is needed to compensate for the discriminant times q1 so this is what this form is but what is q1 x plus a n q1 y it is just the value of q at x y right q of x comma y because q is q1 plus a n q1 so when you have this substitution it is just the value of q at at the generic point x comma y comma so qxy times q1x an times q1y times q1. So now, uh, now it is uh, simple to see that you can take out this qxy factor. So you have q1 orthogonal q1x times q1 is q1 and q1y times q1 is q1 because q1 is multiplicated. So what you get is an q1 which is just qxy times q. So we have shown that q is isomorphic to qxy times q over 
the rational function k k x y. So the criterion one implies that q is multiplicative. Okay, so this is the proof that the form q is multiplicative. I'll just leave it to you to work out the other way implication that in fact any form which is multiplicative is isomorphic to an n fold Fister form. Okay. okay, so now we have a complete characterization of what are all the anisotropic forms over a given field which are multiplicative. Okay, so one of the immediate corollaries which is a very very useful fact is that Q, um, Q is n fold Fister. Then Q is isotropic. Once it is isotropic, then it is completely Q is hyperbolic. Okay. Once the form represents zero non-trivially, then it becomes completely split. It is the hyperbolic form. This is a very, very, very special property for multiplicative forms. So the proof, suppose um, Q is, suppose it represents uh, uh, as zero non-trivially, then we know that we can split off some number of hyperbolic planes and then split off Q1. Q1 is anisotropic. This is which decomposition. You can split off a hyperbolic plane with uh, something left over which is anisotropic. Now uh, let me take the generic set of variables Qx times uh, Q where x is, uh, x is the set of variables x1, x2, x2, uh, 2 power n, okay, where uh, q is n fold Fister form. qx times q we know is isomorphic to q because q is a Fister form. This is qx times 1 minus 1 r orthogonal qx times q1, okay. But you multiply the hyperbolic space by a scalar, it remains hyperbolic. You have still a Lagrangian. So this is just 1 minus 1 to the power r plus qx times q1. So the left hand side is 1 minus 1 to the r orthogonal q1. So you have this um, equal isom isomorphism and we can use width cancellation to knock off this 1 minus 1 power r. So you have q1 isomorphic to qx times q1. Okay. Suppose c is a value of q1. Take pick any non-zero value of uh, q1. So you have that qx times c See, this is represented by the right hand side. So it is represented by the left hand side. So Qx times C is a value of Q1. Okay. Qx is summation i x i squared. So what does subform theorem say? Whenever the homogeneous form times a scalar, this is a value of Q1. This means that Q, Q C times Q is a <coughs> subform of Q. Q1. Q1 is anisotropic, notice it. So subform theorem says that C times Q is a subform of Q1. But there is no room for Q1 to accommodate C times Q1 because Q1 is at least uh, the dimension of Q1 is 2 power n minus twice r because it represents 0 not trivially. So this is uh, this leads to a contradiction unless Q1 does not exist which shows that Q is itself a sum of plates where r is the correct number. Okay. So in fact once a uh, Fister form is isotropic, in fact it is completely hyperbolic, okay. So we have anisotropic Fister forms or if it is of the form tensor 1 AI then it is just a split quadratic form. In fact someone asked me yesterday what about 1 minus 1, it is 0 in the width group, do you think of it as a Fister form? By definition 1 minus 1 looks like 1 comma A, it is Fister but it is a 0 Fister form, okay. There is the class of all 0 Fister forms and the class of all anisotropic Fister forms, these are the only two possibilities. Oh, okay, so and then um, of course um, now we can see immediately the following question which was once a challenge for some time whether um, product of sums of n squares is again a sum of n squares for which integers n universally product of uh, product of sums of n squares is again a sum of n squares. Okay. So um, we, do, we are not thinking of any specific field essentially over all possible fields say characteristic 0 this is the question. So sum of n squares is simply the value of the form 111 1, 1, okay n tags. 
So you take any value of this form, this is precisely sum of n squares. Essentially, the question we are asking is when is product of uh, sums of n squares, uh, sum of n squares is the same as when is this form multiplicative? Is this form multiplicative? Okay. So, in fact, we have the answer namely if and only if this is multiplicative, if and only if n is 2 power m. Okay. Once n is 2 power m, it is 1, 1. 10 sorry m m times so it's the first form it's multiplicator so this is the answer to the question when or any field you can think of product of sums of n squares is again a sum of n squares just immediate from Fister's multiplicative theory okay so now uh, we go on to right um, i just said sort of universally starting q and so on or whatever field extension you can think of you want it to be product okay so i didn't specify which field all right so yeah okay so uh, now uh, i'll start with uh, uh, one invariant associated to fields, the so-called the level of a field. So level of a field. So this is uh, denoted by S of k. So this is the first numerical in, uh, integer invariant associated to fields. This is the least integer n such that minus 1 is a sum of n squares. Okay, this is the level um, level of a field. It's a, of course this level is infinite if the, the field has orderings and so on. Sums of squares is never zero, but it is it is more uh, an invariant uh, which is interesting for non-formally real fields. <coughs> so once again, um, for a for a while, so the known fields, uh, for instance, um, um, the known fields seem to have levels always a power of 2. So this was a question whether uh, S of k is always a power of 2. Okay, so I'll straight away show because I don't want to spend time on examples which you can think about. So in fact, Fister's theory answers this question immediately. Okay. In fact, the level of a field is always a power of 2. I'll just say in one line why this follows from. By the way, I mean, I was just told that I removed the slide too quickly so you can't see. But just raise your hands in case I'm too quick so that I can put it back. So, okay. <clears throat> so, suppose uh, m is equal to level of k. Just find it. Let me assume. So, I want to say that m is a power of 2. So let us uh, choose integer n such that m lies between in this range. So I know that minus 1 is u1 squared plus u2 squared dot 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 um squared ui is in k star. So you can express this as a sum of n squares. Let me split the sum into the, so I will just write 0 as u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u2 power n squared plus u2 power n plus 1 squared. I will split the summation into two parts u n squared plus 1. Okay. I will just take this to the other side u1 squared plus u2 power n squared is equal to u2 power m plus 1 squared dot 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 u n squared plus 1. Okay, so and this sum is not 0 because the level is uh, 2 power n is bounded by m and minus 1 is not a sum of fewer than n squares. Okay, so this side cannot vanish so I can as well divide by this sum. So I have 2 power m plus 1 squared dot 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 u n squared plus 1 divided by u1 squared plus u 2 power n squared. Now if I look at the numerator and denominator each one is a sum of at most 2 power n squares, right? So this, I'm starting with 2 power m plus 1 
up to going on up to m by this range. So this is the sum of at most two power n squares. This is the sum of two power n squares. By Pfister's theory, I know that this ratio is again ratio or product. It doesn't matter because it differs by a square. This is the sum of two power n. Okay, this is a sum of two power n squares, which means that the level of k is actually equal to two power n. Okay, so the level of a field is always a power of two, and um, maybe I'll just mention, which I may use later on, that if k is a periodic field, and suppose q is the number of elements in the residue field of f q is the residue field. Basically, you would like to know when is uh, minus 1 a square or sum of 2 squares. This is the kind of questions. So, S of k is 1 if q is 1 mod 4, is um, 2 if q is 3 mod 4, and uh, p is odd. And then S of q2 okay, is 4. Okay, Minus 1 is the sum of 4 squares and no less in q2. And uh, if you take k over q2 odd degree extension, then in fact s of k is also 4, cannot be smaller than 4. This is a consequence of the following uh, result of Springer, which says that if q over k is a quadratic form, and um, if you take an odd degree extension, so l is to k odd degree, then if q becomes isotropic over l, then in fact q is isotropic. This is one of the very basic theorems uh, in quadratic forms that a quadratic form if, if it acquires a non-trivial zero in an odd degree extension already over k it has a non-trivial zero. Okay, if you use this and the moment's reflection is that if you take an odd degree extension of q2 then the level is still 4. Okay, so I will go on to the next invariant associated to quadratic forms. This is the u invariant. This is again an integer, uh, integer, in, integer valued invariant associated to fields. So u of k is simply defined to be the maximum of dimension of q where q is anisotropic over k. Okay. So you take uh, anisotropic quadratic forms and look at their dimensions. You take the maximum of these dimensions. That is defined as the U invariant of a field. Once again, this U invariant um, is not so interesting for fields with orderings and so on. In fact, it is interesting for fields with orderings. It, it, is, it is defined, it, it has an alternate definition which makes it finite for fields with orderings, but we are not going to enter into that discussion. So, um, I mean, uh, let's look at some examples. Of course, U of uh, complex numbers is one. And um, a finite field is 2, every three dimensional quadratic form or a finite field has a non trivial 0. And if you take a transcendence degree 1 field or an algebraically closed field, then u invariant is still 2. And uh, <coughs> this is sense theorem. So you take a periodic field, you know that every five dimensional quadratic form or a periodic field has a non trivial 0. Uh, and there is a four dimensional quadratic form we have written down, which is anisotropic, namely the norm form from the quaternion division algebra. So the u invariant of qp is 4. And uh, if you take, for instance, a totally imaginary number field, then you have this Hasse Minkowski's theorem says that if locally a form has a 0, it has a 0 over the global field. So this is again 4. So another one more important class uh, I want to write down is the following. Suppose u of k is n for a field, for a field k, then I would like to know what is u of k double parenthesis, the Laurent series field. Okay, this is precisely twice n. Okay, this is easy to see because as we said earlier, the Laurent series field, the square classes are easy to decipher. Okay, so every square class here is either uh, I'm throw it as in characteristic k is different from two. Either it is a, the scalar square class, a square class from k star or a, a square class from k star times t. Okay, These are the square classes in the Laurent series field. So any quadratic form here looks like u1, u2, ul 
orthogonal three times v1, v2, vs. Okay, where uis and vis are in k star. So any quadratic form when you diagonalize it looks like this. And suppose if L exceeds N, so this form is isotropic over K already, therefore it is isotropic over K double parenthesis T. On the other hand, if S exceeds uh, N, so this part V1, V2, Vs is isotropic. So T times that is isotropic. So the sum, orthogonal sum is always isotropic if L exceeds N or S exceeds N. Okay, therefore you see that if dimension of Q is bigger than 2N, Q is isotropic. <coughs> So this means what? This means that the u invariant of k is bounded by 2n. Now I have to uh, produce a form which is anisotropic of dimension 2n. Suppose q0 is anisotropic over k of dimension 2n because dim q, the u invariant of the base field is n. So you can find an anisotropic form of dimension n over k. So I just take q0 plus t times q0 itself. You double the form with a t, then it is an easy exercise to show that this is an this does not represent zero non-trivially over k double parenthesis t. Okay, just write down elements clear denominators. So you see that this is anisotropic. Therefore, the u invariant of the Laurent series field is to n precisely. Okay, as I can just go a little more general than this and say that suppose k is a complete this this is a, an example k double parenthesis this Laurent series field is a typical example of a complete discrete valuated field whose residue field is little k the valuation is given by value of t is 1 okay that's a discrete valuation so i can slightly extend this suppose k is a complete discrete valuated field and suppose kappa is the residue field <coughs> And suppose, I mean, of course, let's assume that characteristic of kappa is different from 2. Then if u invariant of kappa is n, then u invariant of capital K is twice n. Okay. So you just need to replace this, getting it as scalars to something in units and then use Hensel's lemma okay, as a substitute. So this is, uh, so in particular, you see immediately that from u invariant of fp, a finite field is 2, that u invariant of qp is 4, for instance. Okay, so this gives you a handle to construct fields with u invariant 2 to the power n, right, for any n. Because uh, if you take u invariant of the complex numbers x1, x2, xn, you take the iterated power series. Okay, each time the u invariant goes up by twice that. So this is bounded by, it is equal to 2 to the n. That's what we have seen. Each time you go to the Laurent series field, the u invariant gets multiplied by 2. So there are obvious fields with u invariant 2 to the power n. So there is another class of examples for which um, the u invariant uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be also inferred. For these, are, I mean, let me just say what are CI fields, the CI condition for a field. So K is CI if every homogeneous form in, in N variables and degree D with um, N strictly bigger than D to the power I has a non-trivial zero in K. So non-trivial zero in K. Okay, so if you take a forms with the number of variables far exceeding the degree to the power related to this i, then such a form has a non-trivial zero is a CI condition. So if k is CI, then you know that there is a bound on the dimension of anisotropic quadratic forms because quadratic forms the degree is 2 and if the number of variables is n, if n exceeds d squared, then it is necessarily isotropic, right? So u invariant of k. to the i. So the u invariant of ci fields is bounded and then you can use this remark to show that if you take for instance the Rashi function field in n variables 
who are complex numbers the u invariant of course it is bounded by n but then you can show it is precisely n and it is an exercise to show that if you take the, this n fold fister form 1 t1 tensor 1 tn this generic n fold fister form this is anisotropic over c so the rational function field in n variables over complex numbers has u invariant precisely 2 to the n okay so these examples or sort of uh, fields which are natural uh, which occur in nature they all seem to have u invariant a power of 2 so this led Kaplansky to ask the question is u of k always a power of 2 okay this question in fact um, was taken more seriously after Pfister's uh, proof that the level of a field which is the other integral invariant associated to fields was proved to be a power of 2. So but this stayed uh, challenging for quite a bit of time until uh, late 80s or the beginning of 90s Mercury he came up with examples so there exist fields k with u invariant of k equal to 2n for any even integer any integer n okay so he constructed fields with u invariant any given even integer in particular for instance uh, 6 was the first non trivial open case whether there existed fields with u invariant 6 was the first non trivial case and in fact one uh, one knew that uh, 3 5, 7 are not u invariants for any k. See, this is, a, I think it is an easy exercise to prove this using Pfister's theory. It's elementary. So, you can, you can show that 3, 5, 7 k. For instance, let me say uh, 3 for instance. So, if you take a rank, uh, suppose there is a rank 3 form which is anisotropic. Anisotropic over k. I want to show that uh, then there is a rank 4 form which is anisotropic then the u invariant cannot be 3 okay so by scaling the form I can assume that it represents 1 so I can write the form as 1 a b a b so this uh, this form is anisotropic would mean that if you take this uh, 1 a b a b complete it into a 4 dimensional form with discriminant 1 this is anisotropic is it clear because this 1 a b a b is a fister form Otherwise, if this form is isotropic, what happens? It's actually hyperbolic. So, this will be isomorphic to the split hyperbolic form, which is 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. But I can rewrite this as 1 minus 1, say AB minus AB, because AB minus AB is isomorphic to 1 minus 1, which is hyperbolic. Now, I can cancel. Um, a B so you get that 1 a B is isomorphic to 1 minus 1 minus a B which means that this form represents contains this hyperbolic plane so the form you started with becomes isotropic yeah, yeah. so once the rank 3 form uh, if the associated rank 4 form built from the rank 3 form by adding the discriminant if that is isotropic already the rank 3 form is isotropic so 3 for instance cannot be u invariant so 5 and 7 also in a similar fashion little more of Pfister's theory would give that you cannot have 5 and 7 as u invariants okay so the mercurius examples starting with 6 were something which was um, which came as a sort of um, um, unexpected answer to this question Okay, so and uh, of course there are further questions. What are all the missing u invariants for fields? How about the odd u invariants? I'll just state that uh, uh, there is this field with u invariant fields with u of k is nine. So this this came about ten years later from Isbolden, and then um, essentially I think two thousand eight or something. So, Vishik showed that there exist fields with u invariant of the type 2 power n plus 1 for any n. So, this is Vishik. Okay, still there are questions. Uh, 
are these the only invariants in odd numbers or there are other gaps and so on. I mean, there are open questions around for the possible U invariants, which are odd numbers. Okay. Okay. So now I just want to uh, explain that um, the U invariant, the behavior of the U invariant under purely transcendental extensions is very little understood. You go from K to K of T and suppose U of K is finite. That is, there is a bond for the dimensions of anisotropic forms. Does this imply that U of the rational function field? This is finite. Okay. This is a completely open question. One does not know in general if the U invariant of a field is finite, whether that implies the U invariant of the rational function field is finite. But the most tantalizing part is that this is open already when K is Q2 for instance the field of direct numbers okay we know that u of q2 is 4 so the question is what is uh, uh, is u of q2 of t finite this one does not know whether there are arbitrarily large dimensional anisotropic forms over q2t or it has a finite u invariant one does not know in fact what is the expectation so the expectation is that the U invariant is 8. This is in analogy with the positive characteristic. Suppose you replace QP by a positive characteristic local field. That is you take a finite field and you take Laurent series field in one variable over a finite field. Okay, QPT you are going to take rational function field over QP. So let's take rational function field maybe X Laurent series in X say. So let us take FQ. Laurent series X which is a positive characteristic local field and then you take rational function field in one variable over this field. Now FQ is C1 so FQ double parenthesis X is a, actually a C2 field and this whole thing is a C3 field and so you can show that in fact U invariant of this field is exactly 8. It is bounded by 8 because it is C3. But in fact, it is equal to 8. You can just uh, produce a dimensional form over this field, which is anisotropic. So, um, expectation U invariant of QPT is in fact 8. So, this is the this is the sort of conjectural value of this. And um, in fact, in fact, one uh, knows today that. Uh, that u invariant of qp of t is 8 if p is different from 2. So for all uh, odd p's, you take the periodic field and you take the rational function field in one variable. This is a theorem of Suresh and myself. This is uh, in 2007. This was resolved only in 2007, though already in the late 90s, one knew finiteness of in this case of q p of t was no, was known. But there were worse bounds than 8 but now it is now settled that u invariance of such fields is in fact, in fact every 9 dimensional quadratic form over q p t is has a non trivial 0 and and you can exhibit this was known for a long time 8 dimensional quadratic forms which are anisotropic. Okay <clears throat> so what I would like to show next is that knowing something better about, see we have seen that quadratic forms have invariance in Galois cohomology. So if we know some kind of efficient generation of the Galois cohomology groups, I will just explain what is efficient generation. Then one has a good idea of estimating the U invariant of such fields. So that is what I want to say. So suppose um, U invariant of K is finite say. Suppose it is finite for some n. So what are all the con conclusions you know? This means that you take Hn of k, the Galois cohomology groups, all this vanish. Okay, I am assuming Vygotsky's theorem. So the, the large Galois cohomology groups with z mod 2 coefficients vanish. Why? Because you have a suggestion of in of q, grant Milner conjecture, you have a suggestion of in of k to Hn of k. Let me remind you, these are the Galois cohomology groups I introduced yesterday. 
This is Hn of the absolute Galois group of K with values in Z mode to Z. So you have the subjection from the uh, nth power of the fundamental ideal to Hn of K. This is a part of the Miller conjecture. And we know that this is generated by n full Pfister forms. Pfister forms. And if um, n is uh, bigger than the small n, okay, we know that um, every n fold Pfister form is isotropic because the u invariant is bounded by n. And once an n fold Pfister form is isotropic, it is hyperbolic, it is completely zero. Okay. So you'll get that if n is uh, sufficiently large, this i n k is zero, which means that h n of k is zero. So the Galois cohomology groups beyond a um, finite level, they all vanish. Okay. So now we would like to put some bounds for how nicely these groups are generated up to a certain point. Then you would con like to conclude that the u invariant of field can be bounded by this kind of good generation. So let me just assume that, um, okay, so we want to prove the following. So let me denote by Hn of um, decomposable of K. This is simply the set of all elements which occur as cup products. Okay, the Hn K is generated by such cup products because In of K is maps onto this by the En map and In K is generated by Pfister forms, so whose images are such elements. So Hn decomposable is the set of all de um, cup products like this, which is a subset of Hn of k. So let us let me call elements of this Hn decomposable. Let me call them as symbols. Okay, just for anything which looks like cup product of such elements, let me call symbols. We know that symbols generate the nth Galois cohomology group. And in fact, um, okay. Suppose I put the following condi condition with conditions. Suppose H n uh, H n of k is zero. The nth Galois cohomology is zero, which would mean that all the higher ones will also be zero by Pyrrhus theorem. And suppose the lower cohomology groups hi of k is uh, in hi of k every element is a sum of is a sum of at most um, uh, ni symbols how many minutes i have one minute okay then it would mean um, then u of k is less than or equal to a function which de de depends on this n1, n2 up to n, n minus 1. Okay, you just take the efficient generation, how many symbols are required to generate elements in hn of k, hi of k up to n, then in fact the u invariant is bounded by some function which depends on just this, uh, this number of symbols required to span this uh, hn of k. Okay, so this I have written down in the notes. I mean, um, we know that if you take a, a symbol from where it comes from, from quadratic forms, so you can subtract out from Q a suitable sum of symbols to get something in high power of i n and high power of i n is zero because h n is zero. So you get this bound for the u invariant starting with bounding the number of symbols required to span h i of k. <coughs> in fact, um, maybe just two minutes. So um, I know you all have a long day, so I'll just talk in a couple of minutes. So in fact, the, the point is, I mean, the, the story of finiteness of the U invariant for QPT, it started with the theorem of Saltman, which when you take the field like QP of T, what he proved is that H2 of QP of T, every element here is a sum of two, two symbols. So this is a very basic fact which started evolving the finite uh, finiteness of the u invariant every element in h2 you can think of it as elements in the brower group every element is a sum of two symbols this is the very basic thing which started off finiteness 
and then uh, Suresh and myself we proved that every element in H3 of QP of T is a symbol actually sum of just one symbol and then we have certain cohomological dimension property for these fields which say that H4 of QPT is 0. Okay, it starts with H4. The number n we started here is 4 for such fields. So H4 is 0. Every element in H3 is a symbol and every element in H2 is a sum of two symbols. So when you have this estimate worked out for this case, you will find that u invariant of k is less than or equal to 18 is immediate from this uh, from these bounds. But then uh, to come down to the correct number involves a lot more work. Okay, stop.